I'm Chris Farrell from the All Things Good and Nerdy podcast, a wacky weekend morning show, part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out right now. Shows on the network are individually owned and the opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other awesome geeky shows over at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. Welcome to episode 299 of Better Podcasting. On this show, we continue our podcast media host discussion talking about Spreaker. But first, in this week's Better Podnerings, topics include a Libsyn feature going away and some miscellaneous studio updates. And finally, in this week's Better Podback, I'm on a first name basis with a repair tech. Lauren, we're on a first name basis with you. Start the show now. This is Better Podcasting. We are hobby podcasters through and through, just like you. That's why we are different. We minimize the money talk so that you can focus on building a better podcast. Welcome to episode 300 minus one of Better Podcasting. I am Steven and I am pleased to say SP is here this week. I'm here. I'm in the seat. I'm on cold medication. I promise you it's going to be a good show. Yes, we're here to talk about podcasting. And if you didn't know this, we are part of the Gunna Geek Network, which has some awesome, amazing, geeky podcasts on there. You should check that all out. But you should also go to the Gunna Geek Discord at betterpodcasting.com slash discord. And you can talk about podcasting with us over there when we're not recording this show. Because contrary to popular belief, we do occasionally not record this show. Occasionally. Occasionally, yeah. Possibly. We, we take like, I don't know, 10 minute break every 24 hours. Yeah, that break is needed because you got to <laughs> offload some of that coffee, right? All right, let's start off the better podnerings talking about a Rodecaster Pro 2 adapter because for those of you who have not been playing along with your favorite weekday game show, SP's Broken Roadcaster, you might not have caught the fact that there is a recent issue that SP had with his Roadcaster Pro 2, again, where the power adapter failed on him. Yes, the failed power adapter is hanging hangman style just over the shoulder, just right there. You can see it. It's oh, draped over the Roadcaster Pro 2 box. It came in. Yep, right there. And I do have a new one. Road sent me out a new one. It's not powering my Roadcaster Pro 2 right now. We talked last time how I bought a J5 Create 100 watt system and it's the adapters working right now. And I just haven't had time to put this in, but I do have it. Thank you, Road, for sending it out. I said I would leave my comments for later once I got the adapter. And here's the comments. The fact that the adapter failed a few months after receiving the second RMA replacement is completely ridiculous. I just can't rate Rhodes reliability as high as maybe I once wanted to, although I didn't have to pay for shipping of the adapter. So that was something with the RMA that I would have to pay to ship the unit to Rode, their service center, and then they would ship out the replacement. I didn't have to pay for the shipping. And here's hoping that the gear lasts until I can purchase an adequate comparable replacement, a third generation system by some company. Maybe it'll be Rode, maybe it'll be Mackie, maybe it'll be Tascam. I don't know who's it gonna be, but as soon as there's an comparable replacement, I will be getting a replacement for this because even today, as I booted it up, I got the screen of static death where Ugh. it loaded and it just didn't load all the way. I had to pull the power plug out, put the power plug back in. It hasn't happened that often, to be honest with you. It did when I first got this replacement machine, but it hasn't happened in a while. And then all of a sudden it's I've gotten like a two in a two week period or something like that. So I'm, I, I don't know. I just hope it doesn't quit on me before I have to get a replacement. It's just too expensive to be doing that sort of stuff. I'm so glad that you brought the adapter up because for those of you who haven't been following along with this, you might not have realized that uh, with the Roadcaster Pro one, 
there was a bit of an adapter difference that we noticed. There were several different adapters that we found within our community shipped with the Rodecaster Pro 1 that used an analog signal. And it was a different spec than what was actually listed on the back of the board. But, you know, this one here, as you mentioned last week, is a USB-C based device, uh, I believe power delivery. And so when you posted the picture in the Discord, because you did post a picture in the Discord, there's a couple of things I noticed. The first is the model number is slightly different. On the old one, it said YDSPD30A, but then on the new one, it said YDSPD30. And then when you go through all the various output voltages where it lists it, like, you know, it says, for example, 5 volts, 3 amps, and it works its way up to 20 volts at 1.5 amps it matches up on the output side of things. But what I noticed was on the input side of things, for some reason, the spec on the old one was listed as a input of 100 to 240 volts at 0.75 amps. And then the new one was listed as 100 to 240 volts at 1.5 amps. So I'm not sure what that difference is when the output is the exact same. Is it efficiency? Is it a label issue? But it was something that caught my attention. And uh, you know what? I think that it just goes to show that it's probably good that you have a backup adapter on hand. <laughs> yeah, I hope this works. Let's just put it that way. I hope this works. I hope I can get to the next purchase at some point. So we talked about gear refresh a long time ago. How often should you refresh your gear? And I said three to five years, you should plan on refreshing your gear. This has just broached the two year mark for me. So feasibly, you would want to get at least another 12 months out of it. And hopefully even an additional 24 months beyond that. So we'll just see how this goes. But like I said, if one comes available that's comparable or better for the same or less money, I'm going to go ahead and, and get it because this has been ridiculous. All right, well, let's go to the next point here, which is about Libsyn closing their Libsyn Studio capability because Pod News reported on May 23rd that Libsyn sent out an email blast to their customers that the Libsyn Studio was going to end. It said, Dear Libsyn Studio customer, thank you for exploring the Libsyn Studio offering. We have made the difficult decision to discontinue the studio recording tool all episodes that were finalized in the studio to date are still available as files in Libsyn. This change does not impact other Libsyn plan level features. So uh, that whole all-in-one recording solution seems to really be uh, becoming a dream for us. <laughs> I, I don't know anybody that does it, to be honest with you. The fact that this was audio only probably did not do any favors to it. And it also probably speaks to the fact that Libsyn just doesn't want to invest in this area. It is not advertisements. That's how they want to make money going forward. They've stated that. They've stated they want to be an advertisement company. So they're going all in on that. And because of that, they are shortchanging areas which might be beneficial to hobby podcasters. This is a free tool as long as you were on the Libsyn $20 a month plan or higher. And it was audio only, so you couldn't see the other person. I always have problems with those types of connections. As much as we've been doing connections uh, all the way back through Blab and, and Hangouts on Air and, and OBS and going forward with how we're connecting now, even on Skype, we ha always had a video context. So you could give visual clues to your other co-hosts and guests on when you wanted to talk. And when you don't have that, it's almost a, you say something and then you pause and the dramatic pause is like in radio speak, the over, <laughs> like you, you keep uh, on going. And then when you stop, it's like, okay, over to you. Or what do you think about that? Or whatever you ended on some way that you cue the other person that it's their turn to talk. Otherwise you have quite a large pause in there that's possible. Or the other thing is you keep talking and then somebody else talks over you and it's just a bear to edit in post. So I never really understood audio only recorders in this day and age without any visual clue whatsoever, regardless of whether they record video or not. 
We never, in full disclaimer, we never tried Libsyn Studio. We qualified for it because we're at the $20 a month plan or higher. We just never used it. And it's because we had other things. And I think for the most part, other people had other things. And Libsyn was never known for, hey, did you use Libsyn Studio? It's the way you got to connect. I think the pandemic probably sunk the whole thing too. Yeah, um, I definitely remember back in my previous podcast days, when I was recording, I think even the early Gunna Geek shows were all audio only recording and you nailed it. It's very hard to pick up cues. It was amazing once everybody had enough bandwidth to start doing the show by video, even though it was, I believe, still only produced as audio. Just seeing each other makes a huge difference. And like the, the world we live in now, things like Zoom and, you know, remote video, it's so commonplace that it definitely, I think for a lot of people would be a bit of a step back trying to do that because people are used to now, you know, you're just picking up a phone and FaceTiming somebody and then, then you make a phone call to them and you're like, wait a minute, I can't see you right now. It's, it's a different experience and trying to record a podcast can be tough. Uh, I also agree with your feedback about probably why they're getting rid of it for profitability. I don't see them investing in much services like this. That's my personal th thoughts on it. I don't think that it's in their best interest uh, from a business perspective. Definitely not with their announced strategy that we talked about before. And as a reminder, because of that announced strategy, because of everything else, we are leaving Libsyn this year. That's why we're doing this season. We're reviewing other media host providers to see where we want to go to. So that's just full disclosure there. Now, Stephen, I want to move on to the fact that last time we talked about Isotope RX11 and the fact that I hadn't had a chance to use any of it because I wanted to focus on my new Vegas Pro 21, which I needed in order to use the VSTs, threes that were part of RX11. And I did start doing that. What I did is I'm cycling back and forth to work when the weather is good. I put a GoPro on my front handlebars and then I come back. And I, because the GoPro only does like eight minutes and 51 seconds per segment, I think it's just shy of four gigs. And then it will go to another uh, recording. They're seamless in there if you stitch it together. But I had to stitch those together because my ride's an hour long. So I'm going to have several of these. So I take them, the files from the GoPro, save it onto my computer, throw it into Vegas Pro Edit 21, and then I will render the whole thing. And I posted a couple of the resulting videos on our Discord server. So you can go in there and you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, don't worry, I'm working on the audio quality. We'll, call, we'll talk about that later. But it did allow me to start using some of the unique RX11 VST3s. And overall, I'll have to say a combination of Vegas Pro Edit 21, the rendering times look to be a little faster with 21 versus 19. I still had some hardware limitations for extensive 4K video rendering, especially because I was taking those 2K files from the GoPro and rendering them up to 4K. RX11, by the way, is not a miracle worker. Uh, the <laughs> biggest issue that I had from the files that I threw on there was wind noise because I had never done something like this before. And the camera is literally sticking out there in the front, taking 25 miles an hour wind straight at the microphone. So I'm like, oh, great. Well, this muddled everything, but how can I remove that? And you, you can't, you have to have some of it. Otherwise it sounds so underwater, but it did a decent job there is a voice isolator in there so you can take some noise down and you can pump up the noise, the, the vocals a little bit in there. That was interesting. It's not going to save you. We have maybe six dB of play in each direction before it starts distorting things, but it's better than nothing. And yeah, that constant wind noise, I I'll talk about in a future episode, what I've done to increase the audio for that. Not really a podcasting sort of thing, but I've taken my podcast audio knowledge and I've applied it to this particular aspect and capability. And it's, it's pretty decent. If I didn't have any knowledge of audio before I went into this, it would have been much, much more difficult for me to make those files. So I have a couple of new renders out there, Stephen, just to let you know, I'll send them your way as soon as I can get them uploaded to YouTube. 
I'm looking forward to that. Um, two things. Number one, um, the stability thing. I think that um, part of it might be the VST threes are 64 bit. And one of the things I I uh, did ha had to do when I switched to the Mac was get rid of my 32 bit plugins. And I felt like things were a little more responsive, especially when I sort of layered them on. So I wonder if that helped a little bit because they are 64 bit. Um, but the second thing is. Um, I think maybe you need to get yourself the RX 11 advanced because I know how much you hate people named Russell and they have a D Russell program in there. And maybe that would help with your wind noise. There uh, also is a D wind in <laughs> RX 11 advanced. I looked it up because uh, I was just joking with myself and like, Oh, I wonder if isotope has a D wind. Yes, they do. However, RX 11 advanced is $799. Yeah. <laughs> I thought D Wind was the same as D Russell. Isn't it the same thing, or is it? I don't know. They have a specific D oh, Wind yeah, I plugin. See that. I see that. Yeah. Well, then it sounds like you definitely need to get it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last thing that we want to mention here in the better podnerings is, uh, and and this might be a little surprising for our audience, but some people are looking to get rid of Libsyn and move off of Libsyn. I know. No this way. Is first Why time would you're somebody want to do that. It's yeah, crazy. It's just crazy. Mind blowing. But if you were looking for that, you might get on the old Google or the old Bing or the old uh, any Alta of Vista, Alta yeah. Vista or Netscape, Netscape or any of these search engines that are modern. Uh, anyways, you might start searching for an article about wanting to leave Libsyn and you might type in, I want to look for the best Libsyn alternatives. Well, if you do that you might be taken to an article that Buzzsprout just posted called the best Libsyn alternatives for podcast hosting. Now, why are we bringing this to you? It's not because we drink Kool-Aid or anything like that. In fact, Buzzsprout is not on our list, short list of podcast media hosts that we're looking to go to. Wanted to bring this up because I think it's ridiculous, okay? It's absolutely crazy. I get what they're doing here. They're not the first in the space to write articles like this under the guise that they're being neutral. But, you know, they're just, I, I think, probably trying to get some of that SEO action. But I think it's ridiculous, and I wanted to call it out here because how, you're not writing an unbiased article talking about media hosts hosted on a media host page that's not happening the number one listing there as a recommendation is in fact buzzsprout as it should be it's your page your business but the idea of writing an article like this and like i said there's other ones out there it's just it's dirty play so i wanted to call it out yeah, I thought it was incredibly biased because it didn't have the ABC podcast media host company on there. <laughs> that's the Canadian host provider that's owned by you. No, that's not happening. Yeah. So, yeah, it it was it was a little funny. I had seen these articles before. They are on other podcast media host providers. The fact that they chose Libsyn is a signal that they think either via deductions that they've had, you know, actual analysis of the space or just their perception that Libsyn is the biggest SEO out there. So they're kind of jabbing into that SEO. It's like somebody goes, how do I start a podcast? And Libsyn starts showing up. So they Google Libsyn and hopefully this article shows up and then people say, well, there's some negatives to it. Not by the way, the negatives that we have spelled out all the way back to Better Podcasting Live Chat episode 70. It was just a, a short cons, basically. There were some pros in there too. So uh, kudos to them for actually putting pros in there. But then the number one was Buzzsprout. I'm like, yeah, I could see it. They have a lot of fandom. So, you know, you're serving the fandom. You're serving your future business marketing. I get all that. But, you know, they simply did not make our shortlist because of their shortcomings for hobby podcasters. I want to emphasize that we're assessing things for hobby podcasters. If I had to choose a media host provider that was similar to Buzzsprout in the list that we've done Podbean, hands down, would be mm. the one. And Podbean is listed on their list, but it's not number one. Buzzsprout is number one. So, I mean, I like the people that work there. I like their podcast. I actually like their product. It just doesn't have the capabilities that we need. I'm so glad you agree that they posted this entirely because we've been doing that for our season this this <laughs> year, month. I, I think that that's exactly well, the case. What are those better podcasting boys doing? Yeah, we need to get <laughs> on that train. Let's talk about media hosts now. <laughs> As 
As we head toward the final few reviews of this season of Media Host Reviews, it's good for us to reflect on where we've come from. No, we're not talking about reflecting on the season of Better Podcasting Media Host Reviews. We're talking about our history as Better Podcasting and outside of Better Podcasting with media hosts over our time of making podcasts because Longtime listeners of the show might be familiar with the media host that we're going to talk about today because there are many episodes in the past where we've talked about it. And if you are really old, first off, take your back medication. Secondly, you might have actually heard us live stream the recording of this show on this service. Today, we're talking about Spreaker. Yeah, Spreaker's been around for a long time in the podcast space, whether through industry news or even podcast personality news, you may have heard about Spreaker in your podcasting travels. So let's recap our personal history with Spreaker. Years ago, I actually had a Spreaker account and hosted several podcasts on it specifically only for the live streaming broadcasting capability that it had. It was actually a double RSS feed in addition to our main RSS feed. We do not advocate that, by the way. And at some point, I did contact their customer support, and they walked me through how to 301 redirect the feed to my main feed so people weren't trying to get the feed that was on Spreaker, which was an abbreviated feed because I could only have a total of all the podcasts that I had on there, and I think at one point I had six podcasts on there, 500 hours. It was very much uh, like a radio thing, of you do a broadcast and somebody will listen to it within the first few days. And then it would be in your back catalog up to the point where you needed to delete some episodes in order to create space for new episodes. So eventually the streaming world moved on and there were many more capabilities because in the early days of podcasting, streaming, whether it was audio or video, was very difficult. So Spreaker actually enabled that. I thought it was a great capability back then. But when you started to get things like Blab and Hangouts on Air and other capabilities, there was just no need to have Spreaker. The audience moved away from Spreaker towards other avenues. And... There were issues with the 500 episode or 500 hours only of audio you could have on there. So I was never going to choose it for my main feed. Okay, so that was then. And Spreaker used to have this streaming service where you could do the live streaming, as I mentioned before. And uh, yeah, it's it's totally different now. So like a high school acquaintance, we lost track of Spreaker, Right. And there was a level of intrigue for us. So we just put it on the list to say, okay, well, let's go back and revisit them, see what has changed, where they stand today. So Stephen, did you have, aside from like Better Podcasting and Giga Geek, which were streamed on Spreaker, did you have any other experience with it? Only as a user of playing some shows that were streamed out there, like as a consumer. Aside from that, it was basically all through you. <laughs> Yeah. Well, for this episode of Better Podcasting, where we're reviewing Spreaker again in 2024, I imported one of the two shows that pod faded after 2017 that the owner has allowed me to use for these tests. Again, this is with the owner's expressed permission. I do not advocate doing anything like this, maybe with your own shows, but not with somebody else's show unless you get their permission. So I imported the show that I had for our Captivate review over towards Spreaker. And as a note, when I did that, when I took away the RSS feed, I redirected it at Captivate, it automatically canceled my account. It said, we're going to keep this redirect in for you permanently, but I'm just going to cancel the account. So if something had happened to the import and I didn't catch it right away and I just redirected the RSS feed, there would be no way for me to go back and try to grab some of that information and put it in the new feed. So just a special note, if you're redirecting from Captivate that this could happen to you, hopefully your entire show imports so you don't have to worry about it. But there could be cases where you have files that are left behind and you just, or descriptions or something like that, you need to bring it over. So that's what I did. I did an import from Captivate. I just created a brand new account. I know it's shocking. Mind-blowing stuff here. No, I went and created a brand new account 
And uh, I actually found there's no really excess of fields trying to get this set up. It was pretty straightforward. And if I wanted to use the private mode that they do offer for a podcast, it was really easy to see that setting right as I was going through the process. So overall, the setup was fairly easy from a brand new perspective. Now, behind the scenes, we had a little bit of back and forth discussion on how we wanted to handle Spreaker from account perspective. As we investigated, we were actually surprised to see that Spreaker's free plan is actually not that bad for what it is. But there were also some features in its paid plan that might be where a hobbyist wanted to go. So we were torn between do we evaluate the free plan or do we evaluate the broadcaster $20 a month plan? In the end, we decided we'd let our past reviews guide us. And so for this review, we're going to be overall discussing the features of the first tier of the paid plan, which is $20 broadcaster plan, because it's more in line with the feature set that we were looking at throughout this entire season. But as we go through, we'll call out some of the differences you'll see if you were to go just with the free plan. Our reasoning for doing this is because we feel that this approach is more reflective of Spreaker as we work through our highlights, neutrals, and shortcomings that will actually start right now with the highlights. All right, let's kick off the highlights with the affordability. And we're going to give Spreaker a rating of four out of five for affordability with an asterisk on there. Because when you look at the Spreaker plan for features based off of that base paid plan, that broadcaster plan that SP mentioned, it is $20 per month and has a reasonable amount of features that come with that price tag. However, when you look at this compared to some of the other ones that are out there, it does lack some of the features in a paid category in that price range, particularly that we've seen when we've looked at the $20-ish amount or less. But for $20 per month, you do get unlimited episodes with a 300 megabyte upload limit per file. You get unlimited podcasts, so multiple RSS feeds on that paid tier. You also can have the enhanced private podcasts you get what's called advanced statistics, which is not full statistics. Maybe we'll come back to that. And there's also some ways you can make money. There's different monetization options available for you. But the weird thing is, if you're paying money, you have to go up to the $50 Anchorman or higher plan to get things like a customizable embed player and the full level of statistics. See, I said I'd come back. Considering that their base paid plan comes with the unlimited podcast, the RSS feeds, the massive jump between these two plans is a bit of a head scratcher. And it seems like an oddly unnecessarily high amount of jump between the $20 and the next level up, the $50 plan. And when you're looking at it overall, the basic change is, is features like a customizer player. It just feels like it deserves to lose a star, especially when you think about some of the alternatives are, that are out there that offer more features for that price tag. But this is the first place that will actually call out the difference with the free plan, because with a free plan, you get unlimited episodes, although only one podcast or one RSS feed, you get limited monetization features. There's also a decrease in the stats that we'll come back to later. So th this might actually be a tier that works for you if you want to have just one podcast. And we'll give a special shout out to Spreaker as they don't require a credit card for their free plan. Next in the highlights, let's talk about those 301 redirects. And if you need to move, this is necessary. The 301 redirects are found underneath the RSS settings then a button that says redirect under a manage RSS header. It's fairly easy to find. And when you click it, they alert you with information about the redirect process. It doesn't feel hidden as all. As I mentioned before, I have used the 301 redirect in Spreaker in the past and had no issues. And that is with a past version of Spreaker. This is definitely a newer version of Spreaker. I didn't have any issues then. Hopefully today remains the same. But we will call out this footnote to say that we see what you're doing, Spreaker. You're trying to find information in the help section on the redirects. Is the next to impossible? Search terms are buried with information about moving to Spreaker. 
We speculate that's by design. Maybe you'll stay if you can't find the help article. We see you, Spreaker. We see you. And speaking of their help, their help's actually a highlight. When you search through their help database, it was fairly simple to do. It was responsive. And aside from the aforementioned example, we were able to find what we wanted. In fact, I'll give you a little fun fact. As I was prepping for this episode, I was able to find a bunch of answers very easily for the features before I even got to the sign up process. The help gets a special call out as well because a lot of these articles that I was finding had screenshots and the screenshots did seem up to date. So it made it really easy for people to follow. And some of these help documentations that are out there is very text driven, leaving somebody who's inexperienced wondering where this was not like that. I like the pictures for our next highlight. We're going to call out something that we are going out on a massive limb for because we haven't tried it. However, we've been on a quest for some version of this feature this entire season, and we've been coming up dry. The question of the all-in-one solution, for example, recording publishing from the same platform. Spreaker offers two apps for creating podcasts, well, technically four, and call them A. You have Studio for mobile for Android and iOS. In column B, you have Studio for desktop for Windows and Mac. These apps allow you to create a podcast. Now, we will fully admit that this is not what we targeted when we added this to our criteria, but it's something, so it definitely deserves credit. And once again, we have not tried these, so we're not going to swear by them or even attest to them working on modern hardware. They're still listed on the site, and a quick glance at some update dates show recent. And just as a note, I tried to look for the desktop for Windows app and I couldn't find it. That doesn't mean it's not there. It's that in my limited time that I had for this review, I just couldn't find it. Additionally, in the highlights, another long desired feature we've been looking for involves another flash from the past. This is social media account posting and integration. This could be a bit of a sign of their seniority in the space. They remember the times when this was commonplace. And what we saw was the ability to auto post to Facebook. Now, that's the only one that we saw in the different podcast settings was Facebook. But we will take that. Now, things get a little bit confusing. And this might be reflective of some of the things we'll come back to a little bit later. Is when you look for the main account settings, you will see an ability to link up Twitter, YouTube, Tumblr, Google, Apple Podcasts. Those are the words it says. Yes, they say Twitter. But contrary to the top of this page on the account level saying once connected, enabling auto share, enable auto sharing to new, have newly published episodes automatically shared to all of your networks. When you navigate to the individual podcast settings for the uh, connected accounts, we only saw Facebook. We didn't test these out because this is something that we were using test shows and we didn't want to start putting out on social media test shows, but there was the ability to connect Facebook and maybe some of these others, but I think it's probably just a sign of the past for those others. That's my personal speculation. Yeah, I don't know if it had to deal with, they thought that in each individual podcast, you'd have a separate Facebook page for that you'd want to post off to and the others, oh, you just have one account or something like that. So you'd have a different uh, social media sharing experience at the podcast level versus the account level for, because they're assuming you're going to have multiple shows, something like that. I don't know, but hey, they do connect to Facebook. I actually connected to one of my old Facebook pages, so I know the connection works. I didn't test the, the posting though. So Spreaker also checks our boxes for destinations that you want to publish your show to outside of social media. So they list Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, CastBox, Deezer, Podcast Addict, Podchaser and Geo Savan. I will say that is a very modern list of destinations in their dashboard. So kudos to them for keeping up at least for those. And of course, you can also put, submit your RSS feed to others as well if you want to throw your show onto another destination. Next up in highlights, we'll just get super technical. I'm a rocket scientist, so I like the technical. We're talking about file types. Spreaker features the key file type that we're looking for, including the ability to upload a video, but it's converted. It's not actually posting the video. 
So the file types that they list are 3GP, AAC, AMR, ASF, FLAC, MP3, MP4, OGG, RA, WAVE, and WMA. Now, one neat highlight that we thought was worth mentioning was they made it a little achievements page for tracking achievements of your podcast. They focus around episode numbers and download numbers. It doesn't really offer you anything tangible, but gamification's a thing. So I think this deserved to be called out because some people do like to have achievements and see, oh, cool, I got a little badge here for so many episodes posted, or I got a badge here for so many number of downloads. So I thought that was neat. That's a generational difference, by the way, Stephen. Like I grew up, I, I don't need those sorts of things, but apparently a, a younger generation might if they want to gamify the whole thing. So, okay, it's neat. And lastly, in our highlights, there are several features that you may be looking for, like seasons, chapters, the ability to backdate an episode. We'll come to, back to that later. And adding in a transcription URL including specifying the type. So let's move on to the neutral zone. Kicking off the neutral zone, we'll acknowledge Spreaker's ownership. Spreaker was once owned by VoxNest, but in 2020, VoxNest was bought by iHeartMedia. Let's be honest, this is probably good for Spreaker's future since iHeartMedia is a sizable company, but with any sizable company comes the ability to easily make large sweeping changes if they wish. And over the years, we have covered some different rapid changes that iHeart themselves has even made in this regard. With that said, a few Google searches will show that there's no end of articles out there listing the amount of companies that iHeart has been buying. So if you got a large company and you're buying these companies, you kind of have to ask your question, where is your main focus for the overarching company? Is that Spreaker? We don't know. But you also, in that same line of thinking, can't ignore the fact that money is good for business. Shocking, right? Good money equals good business? Potentially. So it's a bit of uh, who knows in this situation because we have seen large corporations drop companies quickly, but we've also seen large corporations be important for helping smaller sections within their company weather storms. Let's move on to something a bit more definitive, their user interface. The interface feels complete. And to be honest, elements of it felt very familiar. It felt like going home in some cases. And this was specifically to Steven, who hadn't used Spreaker before. But here's the thing. That's probably because it feels very similar to Libsyn. And to be honest, after everything we've reviewed to date, Libsyn does feel outdated. The interface feels like there's a lot of features in it with a lot of different options. A lot of the areas we'd like to see in the dashboard are there, including categories for setting and setting themselves. It's also really easy to navigate into different episode specific statistics and see an easy to read information box at the top about things like total downloads, plays, likes, and etc. As well, Below is a per episode graph of the statistics. And lastly, in the good is an angle from the hobby podcaster's perspective. The money sections are largely on their side menu, making it easy for us to ignore if we really don't care about it. However, here's the bad. It feels a bit disorganized and confusing in some areas. But the biggest issue is that it doesn't feel like the interface changes much depending on your tier. It's probably a way to sell you up a tier as you navigate around, you see the fields that are locked if the feature doesn't apply to your plan. The biggest challenge with this is that it isn't always apparent at first glance when a feature is locked until you see the dreaded upgrade button. Again, it's probably for sales reasons, but it definitely inhibits the dashboard experience just a little bit where some of it's blocked off. Lastly, the way that media is uploading can be confusing, especially because there are features that don't show until the episode is published. 
like the ability to backdate a post. I said I would get back to this. At first, I was going to rate this as a miserable fail, the ability to backdate a post, because when you first publish an episode, you must choose today's date or some future date, even if you schedule. However, once you publish, you can also go in, edit the episode, and then you can backdate the post again. So why can you only choose today's date or a future date on a new episode, but yet you can backdate on an edit after you publish? I don't understand. It should be the same interface. It should be the same dates either way. So based on this confusing experience, we're going to place this criteria in the neutral zone for the entire dashboard of the negatives, the cons, and the backdate capability. Now, the next section in the neutral zone is one that we said we'll quickly acknowledge, even though it is not something we talk about regularly on Better Podcasting. It is about the uh, monetization capabilities in the dashboard. There's a new feature they added called the Supporters Club. Basically, it's a membership plan that you can work through for episode specific or show level support. Uh, we don't have a lot of details about this, but it was very clear it was a new feature they had added. And you can also find in there an ad exchange option. If that is something you want to do, we won't get too detailed into that, but it's basically an ad market that Spreaker runs. And if you want to participate in either of these or both, you'll have to make sure you activate it, but make sure you do take a look at the different benefits and drawbacks before you commit to this. Unfortunately, even though there is the ability to sign up for inserted advertisements, there's no actual dynamic audio content. So this on its own is a con, but it's kind of lumped in here because a lot of times people use that for money reasons. But we've talked about before, dynamic audio content isn't just money driven. It is something that you can use for things like announcements or timely audience questions, requests for feedback. So that in itself is not a feature that we see anywhere within Spreaker. So keep that in mind. It's also not available for you to place your own advertisements on there at all. Uh, and this kind of means that it forces you, if you are using that for money reasons, you're going to have to use that Spreaker ad exchange uh, program. You're not dynamically inserting your own. But again, we will call out some free differences here because if this is something that appeals to you, uh, you really on the free tier only have access to the ad exchange. And lastly, in the neutral zone, we're going to put the analytics. On one hand, they technically offer full statistics that you might be looking for. They're IAB certified as well. On the other hand, the type of statistics that are available start limited on the free plan and increase as you work your way up with full statistics only being available at the $50 a month increment plan. Additionally, the retention periods of those statistics feels a little bit short across the hobby level plan. Again, calling out the differences with the free tier, the free tier only offers basic statistics with only a six month retention period, but it doesn't get much better on the paid plan that we're discussing today. The $20 a month broadcasting plan offers advanced statistics for 12 months. The $50 a month Anchorman plan offers full statistics for 12 months and the $250 a month plan offering full statistics for 24 months. It just feels like a hot mess with the structure of it and the fact that the stats aren't there forever. But in the end, on the lower level, a hobby podcaster probably has enough reliable data to monitor their growth, even on a basic level. So maybe it's a little bit of a wash here and thus in the neutral zone. I just want to foot stomp something here and mention that for the $20 a month plan, you did use the word advanced and for the 50, you used the word full. That was intentional. There is a difference on the $20 per month plan. You are not getting all available statistics. All right, let's kick it off the shortcomings with one that surprised us to find uh, file integrity. According to Spreaker's help, all audio that we stream must be in the same format. For this reason, sometimes it is necessary to transcode the audio files that are uploaded so that we can store them in the same format as every other file on the platform. The codec is MP3, the channels are stereo, no joint stereo, the sampling rate is 44.1 kilohertz, and the bit rate is 128 kilobits per second constant bit rate. Now with that said, 
they did not re-encode my imported shows, which are transcoded, as we've stated before, at 80 kilobits per second. Once again, not my show, so I can claim I'm not actually producing. I don't know why he decided to do the 80 <laughs> kilobits per second, but he did. I would choose 96 at the very minimum, and I know some people did 64 in the past. I don't know why he chose 80. Anyway, he has the 80s, and they were not changed at all. What I put up was what came down. So it didn't fit this. But Stephen, what about your new media? I tried going the opposite direction since you had under uh, counted off. I ended up doing 192 kilobit per second stereo file that I uploaded. And it also stayed at 192. So we were both very confused about this. But in the end, we're going to trust their help because this is the policy that they put out there. So it's going to find itself in the shortcomings because when is that enforced? And speaking of messing with our files, they won't mess with our files when we want them to. What are we talking about? It's the ability to create ID3 tags within the podcast media host provider itself. The couple of tests that we did, neither of us saw our ID3 tags edited. So that's a good thing. But there's also no ID3 tagging capability that we could see, which is head scratching because they dedicate an entire page talking about ID3 tags. Here, get this. It gets even weirder. On the help page for the ID3 tag, they say they analyze the ID3 tags. Quote, as part of the Spreaker ingestion process, we analyze every uploaded file in order to identify the presence and the size of the ID3 metadata. So this can be used to accurately measure the duration of the transferred audio excluding ID3, unquote. So if you spend all that time discussing ID3 tags, why don't you give people a chance to make them on your platform? Good question. Moving on to the next shortcoming, let's call out a feature we mentioned earlier in the episode, but does belong in the shortcomings itself, and it's that embed player. We didn't test the customization of it because there was no way we were spending $50 for this one review, and that's what's required to customize the media player. So if you want to be able to customize the embed player, you got to spend $50 per month. To us, that's ridiculous, and it's such a weird feature to put in a higher tier plan. It's it's odd, very, very odd. Lastly, in our shortcomings, the ability to add somebody to your podcast, like a team member or a contributor. For Spreaker, they call it the collaboration feature. Unfortunately, this is only available on the $50 per month plan. And having seen this feature creep into lower tiers on other platforms, it seems they're a little bit behind the times and it's a little limiting to have it at the $50 level versus the $20 level. In summary, Spreaker will work for some people, even on that free tier. Are there better free options out there? That's a maybe yes, because there are alternatives that are free out there that do offer better features at the free tier, such as the better stats for free. But there are a lot of areas where Spreaker is better than some of those options, even on the free tier. However, like we said at the top, we're actually primarily focusing on the larger paid tier. And for that situation, Spreaker has been left in the dust to a degree for some of the options that they are offering in this price range. There are other options out there that offer more for this price range or cheaper, especially if you're willing to accept some download limits, which... As we've mentioned, you might not be okay with that, but if you are someone that is okay with that, you might find some more features elsewhere. But there are features in there that will remind you of the past, so if that's something you're wanting to stick with as well, you might find yourself a little at home paying for Spreaker. But given that Spreaker has passed hands to a big corporation, it is nice to see they're still around and still offering an overall decent service for podcasters who do want to use them. As well, as offering some added features like the newer supporters club feature if you're into money. Overall, it's fine if you're comfortable with the limits of the free tier or paying a little bit of an elevated price compared to some of its counterparts for the features that are offered. But for us, even though we never saw this implemented on our files, 
Spreaker is not going on our short list since the help file says they'll bring the file down in quality. And who knows when that happens and what impact it might have. Although we will say this, the idea of uploading a wave or flack and having them process it is intriguing. This is where we here at Better Podcasting turn the show over to you as we run through some of your feedback. We call this segment Better Podback. All right, it's Better Podback time, and we will start with feedback we got about our last episode, which was not surprising. We had Damien the DM comment about our Patreon discussion saying, doing the media host review with Patreon was certainly an interesting choice. And I believe he was getting at the fact that Patreon is by definition money. And our intro literally says we don't talk about money, but we we had our reasons and I, I made my thoughts very clear about it. But I, I do firmly believe had we wrapped up this season, which is only in a few more episodes, had we wrapped up this season and not done Patreon, I think we would have looked back on this and gone, why didn't we at least dedicate an episode out of the whole season? We've been doing this since what, February? Why didn't we dedicate one episode to Patreon? So I'm glad we did it. Yeah, I think it would be hard to say to get through a review with such a focus on things like Patreon and Substack which are non-traditional podcast media host providers, I think it would have not done our audience, meaning you, I'm talking to you right now, it wouldn't have done you a the proper service of uh, capsulating review of your options as a hobby podcaster. So I'm glad we did it. It wasn't my favorite one by any means. There's definitely some tweaks. That, and there are tweaks that you can use for any of the podcast media host providers that we have reviewed. It's just when you take a look at our criteria, Patreon wasn't going to meet that. Neither did Substack. So we don't advocate using either. Now, I won't say don't use Patreon at all because it's there for additional content and monetization purposes. And that's uniquely dedicated towards people that are creators at the hobbyist level. So yeah, if you want to use it, use it, but don't use it for your main podcast media host provider. And also the other thing I think is worth throwing in here is that we've made it clear. We don't focus on the money here. We're not sitting here telling you how, how do you maximize your podcast to make money? Um, we don't make money with our podcasts, but there are some people who would still define a hobby podcaster as somebody who maybe you know, gets a little bit of money, like they're, they're not sitting there at making an active business, but it's, you know, more like the person who does a little bit of woodworking on the side, it sells it sort of thing, um, you know, but it's still overall a hobby. But I do think that it is, you know, there is a realm of hobby podcasters who still try to collect a little bit of money, but they're not doing it from a business focus. And we won't get too much in that, but I wanted to throw that out there that that is a possibility as well. Yeah, hosting, um, advertisements, equipment money, that sort of thing, I think is entirely justifiable at the hobbyist level. All right. I posted something on the Discord, and unfortunately, my lack of doing a spelling correct on it before I posted it ended up with kind of a weird comment. So I was talking about road, and I, instead of typing in road, it came up as rose. So Waffles commented, he said, Rose at Road? Dude, that's a sign you know their customer support people that well. I love this because I knew it was a typo, but it was just, it was very fitting for your history with dealing with Road. There is absolutely a, a situation where I could see you being on a first name basis with a tech at this point. <laughs> That's basically what happened. I didn't go through their customer support portal. I went back to the emails that I had already received and they must have placed me on a, you know, VIP support customer ticket or whatever. So I replied to the email and granted it was over a holiday weekend here in the United States. We talked about that before, but I did get a response like on the holiday day evening, a, a day later. So what about 36 hours later, but it was still during the holiday. So, okay. Uh, they at least acknowledge the fact that I've been having problems with this. I haven't already made it. We talked about that before, but yeah, road and customer service 
I'm getting to know them too too well. I, I should not know them that well. I should know their sales support and marketing people well, the people to send out free gear so you know you could use it for your show and that sort of thing. I shouldn't know their customer service people. Since we're talking about your situation here with your Roadcaster Pro 2, I wanted to throw this out here to see if anybody has heard of this. This is one that was passively on my radar for, I don't know, a, a long time now that I looked up some reviews um, and, and saw some things and it looked promising, but I haven't heard a lot and I'll throw it out there. What have people heard about the Boss Gigcaster 8? Oh, the, the Gigcaster? The Gigcaster yeah. 8, because it looked very intriguing and i'd love to know if anybody has heard any first-hand experience the initial searching of reviews that i saw looked okay but i'll throw that out there see what see what people say i know for instance tom buck has brought it up in a couple of reviews that he's done and it is his least favorite out of the bunch but it's been around there for a while it was on my radar for a second and then just dropped off and i can't remember why so i'd be interested to find out from somebody who's actually using it what they think about it for sure so that's going to take us to the end of another episode of Better Podcasting. If you would like to hear us talk about media hosts, well, you might have to wait a couple of weeks because next week is our 300th episode. And what's in store? You'll have to wait to find out. But it's our number 300. It can't be a media host. Nope. No. Okay, good. Good. We're, <laughs> we're in agreement. <laughs> so come on back next week for that as well. And hey, if you have had any fun thoughts or memories of our podcast over the last 300, we would love to have you tell us a little bit about that. Just come to our Discord and let us know if you don't get it in before we record next week, which will be at a different time. Uh, you will have to wait to hear your feedback in a future episode. So get it in when you can. If you are streaming this show live thanks for streaming it and if you want to stream the show live go to our discord go to our social media we'll have the information on there about when we are recording next week but seriously It'll if if you're listening right now go to our discord or you or our twitter i'll call it twitter even though it's x go to our social media let us know a favorite memory you have had from our last 300 episodes we really would appreciate you saying what you've enjoyed over the course of 299 episodes but i want to foot stomp i got to get that in there Stephen, for you i want to foot stomp please pay attention to the socials and our discord and our announcements our recording schedule is about to get a little wonky over the course of the next few weeks and it's not our intention but we might not be recording on any given week and i'll get into the reasons why in the future but for now we're going to stick with the plan until the plan breaks. And just a quick edit here. The plan did indeed break. The day after we recorded this episode, we did find out that we are going to have to take a week off here. So that means that you do get an extra week here to send us your favorite moment from the last 299 episodes. But we will be away this following week. If all goes well, we should be back the week after. But keep your eyes on our Discord and our social media for more information. So, for episode number 299 of Better Podcasting, I'm Steven saying it's episode 299, but I know we've recorded more than 299. And I'm SP saying thank you for sticking with us. Let us know what you think. We'll be back with you next time. See ya. Thanks for checking out another episode of Better Podcasting. You can find the full back catalog of Better Podcasting at betterpodcasting.com. If you're into geeky podcasts, please check out the other podcasts on the Gunna Geek Network at gunnageeknetwork.com. This show was produced and edited by Stephen John Drew. Voice work was done by L.W. Salinas. Thanks again for listening or watching, and we hope to see you again next week.